introducing Shannon Robery, who's our featured speaker this morning. And when I was looking over her bio to kind of craft this short introduction, I realized that I think she lives by the, the creed that if one is good, more is better. She is a San Francisco native um, with two Duke degrees. She graduated in 2006 with a degree in English, theater and film studies. And then she got a master's in 2008 in the humanities with an emphasis on film studies and women's studies. She then got a general management certificate at Dartmouth's Tuck School of Business um, in their Next Step program. And she is currently a member of Harvard Business School's crossover to business program uh, where she'll get her degree or certificate for that in 2021 this year. Um, pro professionally, she is a three-time Olympian working towards uh, fourth. She's a two-time world bronze medalist. She's the American record holder at three middle distances, the 1500, two mile and 5,000 meters. And she's been ranked in the top 10 in the world um, for over a decade. She is in conversation today and will be interviewed by her friend and fellow Duke alum, Dora Fang. Dora is a class of 1997 from Duke, but she actually graduated in 1996, also accomplished. <laughs> and she then got her MBA from Dartmouth's Tuck School of Business as well. She spent over 20 years um, with building strategic partnerships and creating markets and catalyzing growth at companies as diverse as eBay and Harley Davidson. Her current focus is living a nomad lifestyle with her foster dog and helping women achieve self-confidence and self-empowerment, self-sufficiency. Self so without further ado and without further commentary from me, I'll let Dora take over and start the conversation. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having us. Hi, Shannon, it's good to see you. Yeah. So maybe we should start off with what our Duke connection is and how we met. Want to start with that and I'll hop in. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, when you sometimes, you know, when you wonder why life works the way it is and things just don't seem to make sense, then these little uh, blessings come your way. And so one of them in my life has been Dora um, and came in a completely unexpected manner. Uh, we when I moved back to San Francisco and I got a, a condo, I grew up in San Francisco in the Sunset District near West Portal. Um, and the first, my first condo in San Francisco as a, my first, my own place that wasn't my parents was right near Dolores Park. And I had the good fortune of having Dora live in the home that was two doors, three doors down. Um, and as a, anyone who knows Dora knows that she's warm and welcoming and extremely organized. And uh, and so one of the first things that happened when I moved into my neighborhood was a block party that she had helped organize, single-handedly organized. Yeah. And in the process <laughs> we met, we connected, we found out we had this Duke connection. And then, um, you know, we, we've stayed in touch over the years and um, I do altitude training in Park City. She was living in Park City. It's, uh, it just seems like life wants us together. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'd moved away and she'd moved away. And then I follow her on Instagram as all of you should too. And I was like, wait, why is she running in Provo, Utah? What a strange place. And so I reached out and turns out she was staying just down the street from me. And I would say our friendship has deepened since we were able to hang out a couple summers in a row in Park City. So, and I went to Duke about 10 years before her. So we didn't actually overlap at all at Duke, but it's definitely a point of connection between us. So anyways, so let's talk about running. So how did you get serious about running and what made you choose Duke to pursue an athletic career? So running was not ever something that I, in fact, sports was never something that I was interested in as a kid. Me growing up in the 80s, um, 80s, 90s, the only sports on TV were basketball, football, and baseball. And all of those were men and none of them were really something that I could envision myself doing. So I was a dancer. Um, I started dancing ballet, then mostly Irish dancing from around five until 16. And in high school, I had a friend um, that was running and uh, on fresh first day freshman year, I, um, I'd always been told I was quick. I also knew I wasn't good at sitting still. so. I, um, I called up the coach and asked if I could go to practice. 
I thought that running would be easy, which that was definitely wrong, but I did um, have quick success at it, which was exciting. And um, ultimately, you know, I, because I didn't know professional running existed, I, um, when I had the good fortune of being in a position to get a college scholarship for, for uh, cross country and track and field, I was very much looking for a school where I could get a great education um, and that I could have a you know, great team experience as well. I knew how important it was to have a strong coach relationship also because you know, the, the training aspect of um, collegiate athletics could take you know, 30 hours a week with all of the training and travel and competition. Um, there were very few schools that had such a combination of academics and athletics. You know, if you go the Ivy League route, the emphasis of, is on athletics, but there's, or excuse me, on academics, but um, they don't give athletic scholarships. On, um, and as a child of a you know, union foreman and a secretary um, who, you know, secretary event planner, that was um, something that was really important to me to help make this um, education possible, affordable. Um, the other route, you know, the highly athletic schools, they didn't tend to stand out as much academically, but Duke, um, you know, hit it out of the park in both areas. And, um, and uh, I'm so grateful that I had made that choice. You called up the coach <clears throat> and just started winning races. That's just how life goes. Yeah, well, if anyone's <laughs> curious, I mean, I could always do a deep dive into the whole uh, high school and um, college recruiting process. But, um, you know, if you're a standout athlete, then generally you'll get uh, letters from, back then it was letters, now I'm sure it's emails. Um, you'd get letters from coaches of interest. But the thing that I learned that was really um, valuable and that I share with other parents, other athletes, is that if there's a school you wanna go to, uh, first do your research, see if you're a viable candidate, but then put yourself out there, reach out to the coach. Um, you know, I think a lot of us assume that if they haven't, you know, if someone hasn't expressed interest, then we just may, must not, be wanted but the reality in the athletic um, scene is that these coaches are their full-time job is coaching but then they have to add in this recruiting recruiting aspect and so um, I can't remember the process at Duke but you know I did create for myself a little running resume with my accomplishments athletically and academically um, you know now if you're a parent or an athlete create a video of um, your different you in, in training or in races um, and really if there's something you want, go after it, you know, be professional, of course. Um, but there's nothing better for a coach than to have someone reach out and say, I want to go to your school. Um, and so, you know, yeah, take, take ownership of the process. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that part. So two degrees at Duke and then a little bit of a detour and then back to San Francisco. And earlier you mentioned that you grew up there, but why the desire to return and base out of San Francisco now? Yeah, um, so I'm so as I said, I'm from here, and for me, family is is kind of my my foundation. Um, I travel in in the peak of my pro career. I would travel about seven months out of the year, but this sense of family, this sense of place, is really my anchor, and and it gives me um, a sense of rootedness no, no matter how much, um, no matter how far afield I go. Uh, I think, you know, I think it's an interesting conversation as well right now when we have so many people in the fortunate position to work virtually and, you know, having the opportunity to make a choice about where do I want to be. And I would say, you know, ultimately it's, it's about finding a place where you're happy. So I, you know, right after Duke, I came back to San Francisco and I was training here, but then I went to uh, Oregon for four or five years, I was training outside Portland at the Nike campus. And, you know, I had committed to that as sort of a running graduate school, but I always knew that I wanted to be back in San Francisco. And um, although I'm still in my running career currently in 2017, I, my husband and I had, you know, some really deep heart to hearts and ultimately decided we needed to be somewhere where we felt happy, where we could put down our roots and be building a life, network, friends. Um, ultimately, we had our daughter in 2018, building our family. Um, and so why SF, why San Francisco for me is because it's the place that's make, that makes me the most happy and um, where I feel I can, you know, really connect to the people and, um, and like I said, it put down roots. And your family is lovely, and I'm so glad that I've gotten to meet your family in town, too. Yeah. So <laughs> let's talk about 
becoming an Olympian and your best Olympic memory. And which Olympics was that at? Yeah, yeah, when we were talking, Dora and I, when we were talking about this business breakfast um, with Christy and Cherie who helped, who were organizing it, one of the questions I shared that I get asked most often is, is about that Olympic experience. Um, it's such a unique, it's just such, it's something that even having competed for myself at world championships, which are very intense, the spotlight of the Olympics, the kind of global focus on the event is something that's really tough to process, exciting, thrilling, like all of the emotions in one. I think for me, my best Olympic memory would have to be in the Beijing Olympics, which um, I don't know if there'll ever be an Olympics of that grand of a scale. And so being able to be a part of that opening ceremonies was um, all of the emotions as well. The It's interesting because you see on television this pomp and circumstance and absolute just wow. But the process for the athletes to get there, I think we probably entered the opening ceremonies around 9 p.m., but it was at four o'clock or so that we all started lining up in the Olympic Village. And Beijing was very hot and very humid. So it was about four, you line up. You We went first um, to, to the fencing hall where we met took photos with the president. Then we went to the um, US president. Um, we went then to the national indoor stadium where we all sat in rows and had um, like basically a little candy lunch bag of dinner. It was, a, it was, a, it was an interesting dinner combination. And, um, and then we lined up again and um, were meandering through these long sort of Disneyland lines to get to the actual opening ceremony. But the payoff of it when we actually got there, you know, you you walk in and you sort of go underneath the stadium in order to come out in the center. And I'll never forget um, that moment walking um, as we kind of crested that little rise and could see the lights and hear the noise and all of the Team USA athletes started, you know, sh chanting USA and um, that that kind of energy that like vibrationally, like uh, the Olympic experience, it's like a vibrational one because the energy of all of those people is just palpable. And, um, and so, you know, that for me was something that I always keep right here. <laughs> That's amazing. And I lived in Beijing right before the Olympics, but moved to San Francisco right after and before the Olympics. And so I was there for all of the construction and ridiculous and didn't get to see the amazing. I saw it on TV and I was overwhelmed just watching it on a flat screen. I can't even imagine being in that space dimensionally. Thank you well, for sharing. I, I love how, so, you told, okay. how you told us like the preparation for the Olympics, like in the conversations we've had that every day it was what, it, like 5 p.m. It would, they would be doing the- Oh, at 9 p.m. 9 p.m. True, for when the opening ceremonies would like yeah. be on TV they'd be testing the chemicals yeah. <laughs> the sky was clear and it would guess you can tell it <laughs> yeah so sort of after rush hour traffic and before sleeping time was about 9 p.m and also when the ceremonies would start actually at 808 exactly because it's a lucky number in chinese culture um the they they have a pollution problem in china and when you push water out of the clouds it pushes particulate matter onto the ground and the sky looks more clear so every night at 9 p.m during 2007 they would practice making rain and by the time the olympics came it was absolutely 100 percent perfect yes. so take from that whatever you'd like from the story <laughs> well that's what i think it was just so interesting for me as an athlete who um had the, my of course my only olympic experience was on television and it is just so inspiring but really kind of you know seeing how the cake gets made you know like getting like a, a glimpse behind the scenes and understanding like just the immensity of the of this production it is the world uh, like in my opinion the world's grandest production so um so yeah <laughs> yeah so the Tokyo Olympics have been in the news lately that foreigners aren't allowed, but they're still gonna have them. So where are you in that process and how do you feel about the most recent developments? You know, my coach, my training group, uh, there's a Japanese athlete, Suguru Osaka. And um, and so my coach has had some conversations with the, you know, Nike Japan and some of the other, um, you know, 
interested parties. And so he's been kind of, you know, preparing us for what might be ahead. I'm, I'm fortunate that should I have the good fortune of all going well and I make my fourth Olympic team that it would be my fourth Olympic team. So I've had this experience three times. I feel sad for the athletes um, who won't get that same uh, stadium experience because that's my other favorite Olympic memory is competing in the Olympic stadium. Um, and you know when I mentioned the vibrational feeling that the energy of the crowd, London in 2012 is is one that particularly comes to mind because that fan base there, um, Europe is really big into athletics as they call it, track and field. And um, I remember in the 1500 meter final in London, it wasn't, it wasn't just the typical, you know, yay, fan noise. It was like, uh, and the, the crowd was running the race with us. And um, I remember having this out of body moment, like, whoa. <laughs> um, so that, you know, I think it's a, it's a, it's sad for those athletes that are going the first time that won't get that, um, get that aspect of it. But, um, you know, for me, and I think for any of us at the end of the day, that's secondary, tertiary, like way, like it's just such other thing to be able to be an Olympian, to be able to compete at the Olympic games. In my opinion, you know, first and foremost, it's representing your company or your, your country, not your company, your country and, um, and, you know, inspiring future generations. And so um, whatever it has to be, as long as it gets to happen. <laughs> Got it. And then what is the sort of stage or process level of making the team and where you're at at that? Yeah. So for track and field, because there's so many athletes that run the qualifying standard in the United States, there's an Olympic trials um, that will be happening in late June. And so essentially how it works on a global scale, they usually have an Olympic standard that uh, um, a time standard or, you know, um, distance if it's throws that you have to meet in order to be a candidate. Um, if you are from a country like the United States where there's multiple athletes that hit that standard, then it's up to the country to determine how they'll select the athletes. And in the United States, we do just a um, whoever's the top three on the day. And so June um, 18th and 21st, <laughs> um, that's the Currently, I'm qualified in the 5K. I have that standard. And um, you have to be top three in the Olympic trials in order to qualify. And so it's a quick turnaround. It's, it uh, can be difficult logistically planning for family and friends. Um, now that's not going to be as much of an issue, uh, but, um, but that's what the process. Got it. Cool. And let's talk about the business end of running. Um, when did it become a business and a career for you? So my, um, at, at Duke, I had a red shirt year. I wasn't injured, but I think my coach had saw that there was the, um, so in, in, in collegiate athletics, for those of you who aren't familiar, you have um, five years to complete four years of eligibility. And um, sometimes athletes coming in will automatically take a red shirt year their freshman year with the assumption that they will be a better athlete, you know, um, on that fifth year. Duke, um, really, at least when I was there, they are committed to trying to have as many students finish their degree in four years or in Dora's case in three. Um, so uh, that's, um, you know, they, there can be sometimes difficulties for, uh, not difficulties, but you know, the athletes are needing to determine um, what makes the most sense. And so for me, I came in, I automatically started competing, but by my, my junior year or where, whenever it was, um, I ultimately took that red shirt. I knew I wanted to work on my master's. And so then that got me an opportunity to have that five years at Duke as a collegiate athlete. And um, I started, I did some competitions and some races. Um, I was good enough to compete in some of the pro races. My coach, I think sort of, like I said, planted that seed um, to, to give me a chance to see how I liked the experience of being in these big stadiums, having more competition. And uh, for me, I, found that I loved it. Um, and so ultimately, you know, if you are in the position to have a pro contract, um, you get it near the end of your eligibility, you get an agent or when their eligibility ends, um, you get your agent, you talk with 
that agent talks with different shoe companies and you get offers. And then ultimately for me, uh, I moved forward with a Nike contract. And so in 2007, I, I signed with Nike and um, I've been with them ever since. And, um, and yeah, I had a, a, pro, a pro coach and uh, I moved back to San Francisco and I started training here. So I know that there's certain hallmarks of you showing up on the track and in advertising and, and I've seen you on a big larger than life ad before at a store. So like, how do you decide and how do you build a brand around who you are, what you stand for in life and on track? Yeah, I think the, you know, some of it as a, some of it is what the, your sponsor says to you. So, you know, will you, in my Nike contract, there are certain stipulations in terms of the amount of appearances that I'll do, um, races that I need to compete in, standards I need to hit. Um, but then in terms of, you know, myself as a public figure or as someone who has the opportunity to, um, you know, hopefully inspire others, it's really about being authentic. I think what's been you know, for me in my athletic career, what I'm most proud of is my consistency to have the average pro career is about four and a half years across all sports. Um, and I've, I'm on year 14 of my Nike contract. Um, and of my 14 years, 10 of them, I was top, you know, top 10 in the world, top three in the U S um, which is not an easy thing to accomplish. And consistency mm -hmm. isn't unfortunately always appreciated in pro athletics. Um, you know, generally your biggest contract is your first one. And then it is less and less and less as the time progresses, which doesn't make sense to me. But, um, but in terms of, you know, beyond that consistency, which is more of a, a you know, that's, that is an internal trade and internal thing that I've really tried to commit myself to. For me, a lot of it has been advocacy. So recognizing the, the things within women's sports that could be better, that could be changed. You know, if you really think about the length um, of professional women's athletics, it's not that, <laughs> it's about the same age as me. <laughs> um, Title IX was 1971, but Duke didn't have a cross country or track team until the, the 80s around, you know, when I was born. And so when I think about my experience through college, it was, I never once thought there were things that I couldn't do as a, as a woman athlete. Um, as a pro, it's been different. There's there haven't been great, um, there haven't, ha weren't until recently any maternity protections. So I worked with USA Track and Field to create a maternity policy to ensure that our um, pro female athletes had health insurance benefits extended throughout, um, throughout pregnancy and 18 months afterwards. Um, the shoe contracts didn't have any clauses about, um, you know, pregnancy and protections there. And that has, has since changed and is changing. Um, and, you know, it's cool because when I, at the beginning, um, Christy had mentioned that my master's emphasis, um, one of them was on women's studies. And at the time, I don't think I really, interestingly, I felt sort of self-conscious about it for a bit. You know, I didn't, I didn't know people would ask kind of strange questions or wouldn't really know what to make of it. But what's so special is that it actually has really set the direction of the, my last, the last 15 years of my life, um, you know, it gave me this foundation of knowledge. It gave me this sense of perspective. Um, you know, first the, I started a nonprofit in 2012. That was kind of my first, um, attempt to try to make positive change. And that nonprofit was encouraging young women in sports, you know, just creating opportunities and expanding the narrative of what it means to be a female athlete, because, you know, most of the movies most of the representations are very um masculine and so just trying to add more stories to that um conversation and uh and then in 2017 i was a the u.s department of state selected me as a sports ambassador sports envoy to morocco where i was able to speak on women's empowerment through sport um to you know in in the countryside in clinics and lectures all across the country it was a really huge honor and, um, and now most recently I'm working at a startup called Parity, which is focused on creating sports sponsorship opportunities for women because the market, um, the global sponsorship spend is so skewed um, uh, with women only getting 0.4% of that 66 billion that's spent annually. So really just recognizing needs and trying to change them 
um, in whatever way I'm capable and, you know, creating a community to kind of raise visibility and think positively about like, okay, here's where we're at. How can we continue to push the envelope? Got it. Thank you for using your voice and your visibility to help advance these issues. Um, do you believe the athletes have an obligation to do so, or is this a personal choice of yours? I think in order for it to be authentic, it needs to be personal. And I think that the other thing that's important is it doesn't changing one life is is success. You know, if you can make a positive impact on one person's life, you've you've done, you've done good. <laughs> I do truly believe that we were put on this earth to leave it a little bit better than we came. Um, but it doesn't have to be a grand act. It just has to be whatever is true and authentic. And I think the biggest thing is just um, existing in the space that you're in, watching, looking, listening, and um, being aware of, you know, what is great and what could be better. And, um, and, and you know, when you see that need, when you see that opportunity, um, if it's within your power to make a difference, then I think that, you know, go for it. And now you have a little girl, you have a daughter. How has that changed? Training, work, family, being in San Francisco, all of that, everything, yeah, I'm sure, right? Yeah, I'm sure everybody on this call can relate to life being busy. Um, mine has, you know, my daughter, to be completely honest, so I have my daughter at 33, I had put off having my daughter um, and I thought I would wait until my running career was over. And uh, because I was concerned about the consequences um, because it truly were, there were truly were consequences to having a child as a professional female athlete. Um, but ultimately, you know, it came down to this is, I knew I wanted to be a mother before I ever wanted to be an athlete um, or an Olympian. And so um, you know, part of that heart to heart that my husband and I had included, you know, I don't want to keep putting my life off. Um, and so, uh, that being said, the, the first, I remember being about a month into being a new parent and thinking, oh my gosh, what have I done to my life? You know, <laughs> just this adjustment, you know, I really loved the life I had. I, I wasn't having a child to, um, like to, to make some dramatic change for the better. Like it was a change for the better, but it wasn't like I needed it to fix my life. It, I wanted it to enhance it. Um, but it did take time adjusting to um, life as a parent and shifting expectations. And, you know, the freedom of movement that I had when I was, um, you know, singled and just married and with a husband who had been a pro athlete and supported my career, you know, that, that was different. And, not only was it different logistically, but from a heart space, I didn't want to be away. So, you know, it, it shifted my focus. It also, you know, I think that some of my, um, some of the work that I've done most recently has been inspired by this shift of, you know, my experience as a pro athlete are some of my highest highs. And then also some of my most, you know, frustrating or painful or, you know, difficult experiences. But when I could shift from thinking of it as, well, I'm tough enough to take it. That's fine. You know, that it may, that may have been dysfunctional. That may not have been ideal, but like I can handle it. When I shifted to think, you know, would I, if my daughter was in that position, how would I react? And when it unequivocally, I would never allow her to be treated that way. Then suddenly it, it was a, a deeper motivation for me to, to try to affect change. Um, and so, you know, she's given me, um, um, she's made life busier, but she's given it a lot more perspective. There you are. <laughs> Hey, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so you said a very provocative word in that answer. You said consequences <laughs> of having a child. And do you want to talk about what those were and what changes you've helped affect and what you think still needs to happen? Yeah. So um, one of them I mentioned, which was the maternity policy. So for um, because professional athlete contracts are currently set up as contractors, we don't have any health insurance. I don't get health insurance through my Nike contract. I have to earn it every year through my performance um, in competition. And then it comes through 
USA track and field and the USOC. Um, and so when I had my daughter, um, or when I was pregnant with my daughter, I of course couldn't compete. And so I was running the risk of losing health insurance when I would really need it the most. Um, and, you know, in my situation, my husband who, um, who is very accomplished in his own right has been my biggest advocate in, in this athletic career and has, you know, when I said I needed, like when I, we talked about moving to Portland so that I could work with the coach there, he, you know, never never tried to get in the way of that dream was fully supportive of that dream but it meant that you know his his career while he's had a lot of accomplishments isn't at the same level than it might have been if we had you know gone to the place that was best for his job and for his dreams and so um you know when it came to me having you know losing health insurance or when it came to facing potential reductions for not competing that bottom line um you know i have to provide for my family. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it wasn't even a, it, it was, it was really emotional. You know, it's emotional anyways, being pregnant because, um, you're hormonal, but, um, and it's a lot of changes, but then to the first few months, just really being fearful of, you know, what, what does this mean? Will we be okay? Um, and kind of being backed into a corner, it felt like at a certain point. And so, um, you know, for me, that was, it was partly necessity. It was largely recognizing that the system was flawed and that I needed to try to help make changes. I think the, the lesson that I learned or that I love to share too about that, specifically the USATF maternity um, healthcare policy, the, the importance of finding advocates and allies. I had had a conversation in 2016 with my coach, his name's Pete Julian. And um, I had mentioned to him how the health insurance process worked and how it made me really fearful of becoming a parent because I was afraid I wouldn't have health insurance. And he remembered that conversation. It was maybe a year later, he was having a conversation with the president of USA Track and Field. And he brought up that conversation with him. Vin Lanana was his name. Vin was also surprised to kind of think of it in those terms um, and, and encouraged Pete to and me to create a committee to work to, to change that. Um, and I am friends with the head of uh, the women's track and field chair. We had a conversation. She kind of created a committee out of um, a network of people who, you know, she were, would be interested, would have great insight and ultimately, you know, and, and lobbied behind the scenes as well to get every, everybody's um, thoughts before it was formally presented. So it had a higher likelihood of passing. And ultimately in, in December of 2018, that new policy passed unanimously. And so, you know, it really, it takes advocates, it takes allies, it takes a team. Sometimes things, the payout is a while later, um, but, you know, it's, it's bringing as many people on board, getting as many voices in, into that. Um, and, uh, and, you know, you can ultimately create change that's really impactful. Yeah, well, I think that you were the perfect person to help in this regard because you had this tremendous or have this tremendously long career. So you bumped up into this like sort of end of childbearing years and the realization that there was trouble and the willingness to like stand up and say, this isn't right and I'm going to help fix it. So this is one of, one of the many reasons why I think you're awesome. So um, we are starting to close into the section of we where I get to interview you. So you want to talk about any things you want to sort of takeaways or sort of advice to the crowd before we open up to questions? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we, uh, the, thanks for reminding me. So when we were prepping, we had talked about some of the um, kind of key things that I've often shared that are sort of, you know, athlete mindset, but really translatable to the business, like kind of business endeavors or just mindset overall. And so I'll kind of, you know, go through those. And if you guys will have time for questions, you can dive deeper, but <clears throat> So it's, so one of them is this idea of the types of, of, of competition. And so as a um, kind of high achiever, as someone who's really thrived on competition, I've, I had always thought of it in terms of me versus others. And it was, you know, how am I doing compared to them? How did I place in this competition? How am I, you know, ranked in school, whatever it might be. And I think that that external competition is valuable to have a sense of, 
you know, where you stand to understand, to, to kind of understand the, the realms in which you're existing <clears throat> and where you're trying to be hopefully exceptional. But the other um, lesson that someone shared with me that I've really valued is this idea of competition is also me versus myself in terms of having the ability to control what like control the controllable so I can't I can't change what a competitor in a race is doing for their preparation but I do have control over my execution every day the the way that I prepare um, the mindset that I bring and so, you know, I think that these two can exist, this competition can exist in, in both ways, but I really try, um, you know, to focus on the latter, this me versus myself, this idea of, um, am I doing the best that I can? Am I a little bit better than I was yesterday, a month ago, a year ago? <clears throat> am I moving in a direction that I want to go? And if not, how do I adjust so that I, you know, so that I can keep tracking and trending in the direction that I want? Um, another one that also is sort of tied to um, mindset is this idea of prioritizing. So we talked about it a bit with family, um, but you know, as life gets more and more complicated, this, I remember having this moment and it was specific to training, but has applied to my life also. And I've been doing it lately as more comes on my plate. But when I joined my new training group in 2000 and, um, 13 and I moved to Oregon and there was all of this new stuff that was coming in, you know, the higher mileage, the harder workouts, the lifting, this, that, the other, so much, so much. Um, and I remember feeling overwhelmed, like, how do I manage all of this? And I was getting kind of broken down and I ended up getting a small injury. And I remember stopping and saying, okay, um, I can only do, you know, two or three things really well, like, or I, I need to create this priority list. And what are the things that are sort of the non-negotiables that if I want to succeed that I have to do? And, you know, in that scenario, I think it was, um, you know, if I'm, if races are most important, then the workouts are the best preparation for that. Then it's um, the lifting because that was really helps keep me healthy. And then it's the mileage and so on and so forth. And really focusing on those top two or three things that I thought would give me the highest chance of success. And if I was doing well at those and I could start adding in other things, you know, sometimes you're able to get to the point where maybe one of those priorities sort of becomes um, uh, on autopilot or it's, you know, you don't need to worry about it and you can shift. But, um, you know, really being thoughtful and critical of, you know, what what are the non-negotiables and the rest allowing it to be, be you know, left aside or allowing it to be put on hold um, so that you can, you know, accomplish, you know, focusing on accomplishing your goal. And, um, and you can also hopefully try to stay sane and healthy. Um, so yeah, those are kind of my, my two biggest sort of mindset approaches. And, and we talked about the third that I had on my list, which is this idea of paying it forward. I love the, the quote, we stand on the shoulder of giants from Isaac Newton, but this idea of, you know, I, am where I am now. We, each one of us on this call, I imagine is in this moment in time in this place because of the work of others before us, the, the, the whether it was trailblazing work or whether it was just the support of, um, you know, a strong foundation. And so, um, you know, recognizing that privilege, that, that blessing, um, and trying to take the position that we're in to create opportunities for others. Thank you. I turned off my video just because I know it's been a little choppy. So I am still here and admiring <laughs> everything that's happening. Um, but I think that Christy and Jury have been collecting questions and we can move to that. And if we won't cover that, I still have more things to talk about with you. Cool. <laughs> oh, you're muted. Oh my gosh, the classic Zoom faux pas. Um, yeah, Dora, thank you. And I saw that you had turned off your camera and I was just going to make that same announcement. But um, we have been getting some really good questions in the chat. So I'll just throw a few out there in the time that we have left. Um, the first one's from Marguerite Rosa, who is actually a classmate of mine at, from Duke and lives in Seattle. Um, and her question would be, what advice would you have for a young student athlete who's kind of coming into the process today um, based on your experiences and what it was like for you? Yeah, so the 
so first and foremost, trying to, you know, going back to why I'm in San Francisco, finding a place that makes you happy, um, uh, trying to find a school, um, especially trying to find a coach um, who you trust and believe in. As a, as a collegiate athlete, you spend a lot of time with your coach. I mean, I spent the most time with him and my teammates. Um, his name is Kevin Germain. He, um, they really steer the ship. And if you are at a program where the coach is not someone that respects you, where the coach doesn't, you know, um, where you can't relate to one another, then it's going to be really tough to feel, to find success. It can be done, but it'll just be a lot more difficult. And so I think for me, it's always leading on, okay, where is the place where I feel like I have the highest likelihood of success? What, where, you know, I looked at, gosh, I did, I think I did 10 unofficial, like I did a road trip along the East coast when I was looking at schools and I had done, we visited 10 different schools. I met the coaches at all those places. And I had visited, um, at least a couple schools on the West coast too. And, uh, in meeting those coaches, it was very, very clear. There were some that I would not do well with. Um, and so, you know, finding that environment, once you've come into a team, I think it's also really important for you to commit to that process. I saw a lot of athletes struggle because they were, you know, they would get the training from their college coach, but then they would talk with their high school coach and they would, you know, then they would create some muddled middle ground of, of the two. And so I believe if you've done the right work in the, um, in the setup and found a, and a coach and environment that is right for you, that you should really commit to that process. And, you know, ultimately if it's not working, then you adjust, maybe you make changes, but, um, but, you know, you can't ever really know unless you fully commit. Um, okay. And this is actually a really good one. I think that ties into a lot of what you were speaking about this morning, but Doreen Wong had a question about and I'm taking just sort of one, she had a couple, but this one really struck out, stuck out to me. Um, what's one change that you would like to see happen sort of now for um, female professional athletes? Yeah, um, so, so the, the maternity aspect has been really important to me and we're making progress there. I think, you know, like I mentioned, so the startup I'm working at, Parity, um, our, we're working in the social media marketing space as just like our attempt to sort of make change where we can. Um, but that stat I mentioned, I mean, $66 billion spent annually and 99.6 is spent on men and there's men's sports. Um, only 0.4% going to women. That's just, it's just a huge, a huge travesty really when you think about it. Um, it's not surprising that I didn't want to be an athlete. Like who would I have looked to for inspiration? And, and fortunately with digital, um, digital media, there's opportunities for these young athletes to find inspiration in people that aren't being covered, but of the TV coverage of the broadcasting coverage of women's sports, it's 4% of the total. So, you know, yet again, there's just such a discrepancy in the way that, um, that kind of women's sports is covered. And, um, it means that I think about 80% of the women that are uh, part of the parity community work second jobs to support their athletic career. And how are you gonna be the best possible athlete if you can't fully commit to the process or if you're even having to pay to play? And so um, I would hope that there's a recognition that these, these <clears throat> you know, sponsorship dollars that are spent are all about what's going to sell things. But if you don't create TV coverage if you don't recognize that the voice of the professional female athlete is valuable, that it can speak to that 70 to 80% of women who control the consumer spend. Like, I think it's a, a, a business proposition to recognize the value of these athletes and to cover them more, to sponsor them, to um, allow them to use their platform to reach their, their fans. Well, and we've seen, you know, glaring evidence of that just this the past couple of weeks with you know the NCAA basketball tournaments and the discrepancy between the testing offered to women the coverage offered to women the weight room I mean all of that so it, it is a very timely um subject uh, yeah yeah so a couple of questions came in too about sort of more kind of nuts and bolts of training things one would be how do you prevent and manage injuries? Because like you said, I mean, your longevity is really remarkable, especially for a, a woman runner, um, because it's such a hard sport on your body. 
Um, and then second, what's the norm for your mileage like in the off season? This is a pretty technical one. And then how does that ramp up in the weeks or months that lead up to a competition? Yeah, so I'll start with the second um, first and then I'll get into the staying healthy. So generally, let's see. In, in high school, I was maybe 35 miles a week. I was never a super high mileage person. Um, I think it's important at that high school level to not let your your young kids who are still growing train too hard. Um, and you, of course, it's this ch tough balance of wanting to you know earn that opportunity on a collegiate team. But ultimately, I would argue that you know, life is a lot longer than sport. <laughs> and so, um, you know, for these young athletes, ensuring that they are, have a healthy mindset towards their competition and training. Um, in college, I think I was, you know, 50 miles eventually got up to about 60 by the end. Um, and actually it was it when I hit 60 miles that I had my kind of first major injury in my career, uh, which was in 2007, actually ended my running career, um, at Duke, I missed my last season because of that injury. And um, as a pro, I've been, you know, 70 has probably been my main spot that I've stayed. Um, I've gotten up to 90, but for me, when I try to get my mileage that high, it tends to have consequences elsewhere. So I maybe can't do as much speed um, or I, I'm, not, I'm not able to um, yeah, have, as, have as much power or speed when I hit my mileage that high. Um, in terms of staying healthy, so I'm fortunate being in from San Francisco. You know, I, um, <laughs> Christy and I, in a very, you know, another cool um, way, we both have the same massage therapist. <laughs> I've been seeing um, Lonnie Green is her name since I was in high school. Um, I had access to phenomenal acupuncturists and my chiropractor, Lenny Stein, he's in the city. He's probably the person I credit the most with keeping my body um, in balance. I have a, I have a leg length difference. My left tibia is seven millimeters longer um, from a, from a broken leg in kindergarten. And so I used to be really resentful about that. I used to think, oh, if only I didn't have that one thing, then I would, I'd be great. I'd have no problems. Uh, and what I realized is I, you know, have been in this sport long enough is that everybody has their thing. Everybody has their Achilles heel. Um, <laughs> and it's more about, um, it's more about acknowledging it and figuring out how to work with it. So rather than being irritated about my leg length difference, just accepting it for what it was and figuring out how I could keep myself balanced and healthy. Um, for me, that entails, um, you know, stretching before runs, doing activation, like prehab exercises before my runs. It includes getting in the weight room, um, keeping, you know, postpartum. I had, um, I've only had two major injuries in my career. One was that one I mentioned in 07 and one was, um, postpartum as I was trying to come back to running too quickly because I was from, from a financial standpoint, worried about my contract. And, uh, um, and part of it was that, you know, after you have a kid, all of your abdominal muscles have been overstretched. So, um, you know, working to get my, my body in more of an equilibrium. Um, but I think it's, you know, for the longevity, it's about always focusing on the long term. I always knew I wanted to have a kid. So it was important that I, um, I, that I kept my period regularly, um, that it, that I ate a good diet in order to accomplish that, that I got all of the nutrients I needed to, to keep myself healthy. And I wasn't, I wasn't always perfect at it. Um, uh, but always focusing on my health first and foremost. Um, and it can be tough, especially on these collegiate teams, you know, eating disorders are rampant, um, especially at a, a high achieving academic school. And then in a, in running, which is also kind of a like high achieving type a mindset. Um, but, you know, by keeping my eyes on the fact that I wanted to, my grandma lived till 94. I want to live as long as I can. And if you think of it in the long term and play the long game, then it does make it, you know, hopefully put, puts things in perspective and helps you make the decisions for health first and foremost. Yeah. I was going to say, I think that does come down to like a sense of perspective. Um, so I'm, I'm watching the clock carefully. I know we want to make sure everyone can get on with their day right at nine, but, um, I guess kind of a two-part last question would be, 
Um, has running, talk about how running has been a full-time job and if it has been over the past, you know, 14 years or whatever, more than that. And then also how, how you balance like the need for training more or less full-time, especially right now with also transitioning to more of a business career. Yeah, that's been, um, so from 2007 until really this past fall, um, running was my full-time job, you know, um, training twice a day, lifting as well, all of the treatment that's involved with it. If you want to train twice a day in order to be able to do that, you have to take naps in the middle of the day because of the output on your body or the challenge to your body and the output of energy. And in 2000, and, and so, and I had always, I had kind of wrapped my head around 2020 being my last Olympic cycle. Um, and then as with all of us, 2020 brought a whole like a topsy turvy, um, the world was upside down. Um, and in my case, that meant that, you know, I had to first determine would I continue to train through 2021. And that wasn't just a decision for me. It was a decision that needed to be made with my family because success doesn't come from me alone. It comes from, you know, yes, I'm the one that toes the line and yes, I'm the one that ultimately, you know, um, uh, you know, succeeds or fails in that race, but uh, it takes a team for me to get to that starting line. And I needed to get, um, I needed to get everybody on board or to get all the, all that support team, um, you know, on board with this process, willing to, and, it, and, and I wasn't even sure if I could handle it, you know, it's, it's a huge emotional output um, and physically as well. I'm 36 right now. Um, so, oh. Sorry, Shen. Also, is your coach, is he in San Francisco or does he train you from a distance and you kind of go back and forth to see him? Like, how does that part work? Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah so he's, and yeah, so my coach, he, he um, well, he, his family is in Denver. He travels um, to Portland or to different training camps. So we mostly communicate through the phone, um, through text and phone calls. Um, and that was part of, you know, when I decided to move home in 2017, that was a, a consequence that I was fully aware of. And so I've had to try to build a training group here. Um, and I've worked with the, I was a volunteer assistant at San Francisco State until they went into shutdown for COVID. I have a little pod that I train with um, that have been wonderful and supportive. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, it's, it's, um, my Nike contract ended December 31st of 2020, and I had lined up a, a role at Parity where I'm working now. And then with the extended season, I've had to try to balance this. Um, I am with Nike, but it's a reduced contract. And I've been working part-time at this startup, but as anyone who's worked at a startup knows, it's never part-time, part it's always more. Um, and so, you know, trying to stack my day, um, I'm loving the things that I'm doing, but it's definitely, you know, a juggling act plus as a mother and a wife um, and a daughter. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, some of it is just like, for me, I'm very, I'm good at compartmentalizing. And so if this were my forever, I don't know that I could handle it, but, but knowing that it's for a targeted date, a, a specific goal, something that, you know, ultimately the decision to train through this Olympics um, through this summer was that, this was something that I could never do again. Once I've moved on from this professional athlete career, that it's not something that you can just pick up again. And so, you know, wanting to see it through to the end and make sure that um, ultimately that I didn't have regrets that I didn't try, you know, might as well try. <laughs> um, Take it all the way, right? Yeah, you know, so. <laughs> um, oh, that's great. And then actually that's perfect timing. Um, and I just wanted to say thanks to everyone who joined us this morning. Thank you, Shannon and Dora. I know you had to go off camera, but we so appreciate your input. And it was great listening to the two of you kind of have your discussion as, as friends and um, Duke alums and all of that. And then to everyone else, um, please, you know, we put in the chat, follow Shannon on Instagram. There's a link to Parity so you can find out more about what they do and what they're doing. Um, and the Duke NorCal board follow us too. We are on Facebook and also on the dukealumni.com um, website on the regional clubs page. And then you can find out we have tons of activities and events that we are presenting, mostly virtual in the virtual space at the moment, but 
Um, on our, April 6th, we've got a great event that again will be virtual and that is how businesses, um, looking at how businesses can uh, address issues around gender bias. Um, so that should be really great. It's with a woman who graduated from Duke and is a professor at Stanford. So join us for that. Um, and again, thanks for being here and enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, thanks everyone. It's a, I appreciate you coming. I hope you had your coffee too. <laughs> Gotta go <laughs> read the line. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you.